My name is Jerry Kaplan. This is an interview for the Maria Rogers Oral History Project of the Carnegie Library of Local History. Today is November 23rd, 2002, and we are interviewing Dale Johnson. Dale, where and when were you born? I was born in 1931 on the western slope <clears throat> in the little town of Rifle, Colorado. Tell us a little bit about your parents. Uh, my my mother came from a ranching family, uh, as did my father. My, uh, my dad became a uh, truck driver rather than going into ranching, however. And unfortunately, he died when I was six, so I was uh, basically raised by my mother. Uh, we lived in a lot of little mountain towns around there. After my dad died, my mom had to become breadwinner. There was no insurance, so we lived in... Uh, Alma and uh, uh, Grand Junction and Montrose and uh, you name it, all over the little places, wherever she could find work and primarily she was a restaurant cook, the only marketable skill she had. Where did you go to high school? I went to high school for uh, a couple of years in Rangeley, Colorado, uh, which was a little cow town, town in the beginning, but then somebody discovered oil out there and sagebrush flats, and so it became an oil town. But my last uh, two years of high school were, and where I graduated from, was uh, Durango, Colorado. And when did you graduate from high school? Graduated in 1949. What did you do after graduating from Durango High School? The first thing I did after graduating from high school was with my buddy Frank Pinkerton. Uh, we, we climbed a couple of mountains there in, uh, in the uh, uh, La Plata Range. Uh, we, I, I learned to love the mountains from Frank Pinkerton. And uh, uh, then that fall before school, or August actually, uh, I went on our first, my first backpacking trip with Frank and some other people. We went up into the Needle Mountains and uh, we had terrible equipment in those days. We had these heavy GI rucksacks that hung from your shoulders and, and just sagged down on your rear end and our sleeping bags were these big rolls of K-Pak, you know, rectangular things that didn't keep you warm at night but uh, were better than nothing. And we just broke our backs carrying that stuff. And we carried canned goods and <laughs> I was looking over some notes the other day. Uh, I ran into a, a, a scrapbook that I had long forgotten about where on that trip, one of the fellas, a jar of something, a jar, fell out of his pack and broke. And I said, well, at least you didn't have to carry that anymore. <laughs> okay. And then uh, in the fall of 1949, I attended the University of Colorado, primarily uh, because of an English teacher that I had in high school who asked me where I was going to go to college that year. And, or if I was, and I said, no, I didn't think so because I knew my family couldn't afford it. And uh, he suggested uh, that I take a, an exam for a scholarship at the University of Colorado. And uh, darn if I didn't win a scholarship, uh, a tuition scholarship, and it was just for one year. And I had to take that scholarship exam each year. And I won one every year, and that's how I, that and, and working uh, summer jobs to get enough money to pay my room and board is how I paid for college. Do you remember the name of the high school teacher? You know, I don't. I'm really sorry I don't. I've even looked in my journals and stuff to see if I could dredge that out, but I couldn't. What was CU like when you came here in, in Boulder? It was, what, 49? Yeah, 1949, if my facts are right, and they may be wrong, but that's close. Boulder was about 9,000 people. And uh, I think when school was in session, college that is, that added another 9,000. And uh, the campus was very uncrowded. Uh, not very many buildings. Uh, there were, uh, there was one, I think, uh, women's, women's dorm. There were uh, two men's dorms. Uh, Norland Library sat out there in a field all by itself. Uh, a lot of space between Norland and the engineering buildings. And uh, 
of course, the old time buildings, uh, Woodbury and Old Main and all of those things were, were there. But uh, it, was a, it was a wide open campus. Uh, you could see the flat irons from almost any place. It was, it was a very pretty place. What did you major in? Well, in the beginning, I, I majored in aeronautical engineering solely because I was so interested in airplanes. I mean, I had no idea what aeronaut aeronautical engineering was. And uh, I just said, well, I, okay, I mean, you know, what else is there that's associated with airplanes? Nothing else. So. And I, so I went to engine school for one year, and I realized that that really was not my cup of tea. Um, I could do it, but I, it was not what I was interested in. As a matter of fact, what I was really interested in was mountains. And whatever was associated with mountains was what I wanted to do. So the, the logical thing for me one then was to switch to geology. And so I did. And uh, I, was, I was an average student. Uh, C's and B's mostly, occasional A, but nothing outstanding. Probably mostly because I spent most of my time climbing. I mean, I, you know, in a way I was kind of lucky I made it through school. <laughs> What was the town of Boulder like in that time, as you remember? Oh, I don't remember much about it, except that uh, when I first went there, there was only one restaurant, and it was Wayne's Cafe. The town was dry. You could buy 3-2 beer. Uh, we frequented uh, Tulagi, which we called the Tool. Uh, sunken Gardens on the corner of, what, College and 13th uh, was known as The Sink, and you could get beer there. And, uh, but you could get no hard liquor in town at all, which meant that all of the liquor stores were just outside the city limits. Uh, and the, the one restaurant did not serve any liquor of any kind. What were the housing arrangements? Well, uh, most freshman students seem to start out living in dorms. And then uh, as soon as they could, they would escape to whatever housing they could find, which was usually far inferior to the dorms, you know, a, a, a lousy room in somebody's basement or something like that. Occasionally, uh, students would get together and rent a whole house, but that was pretty rare. It was just uh, pretty substandard rooms scattered around on the hill. <laughs> you were interested in climbing, and you mentioned earlier that it started out when you were in high school. Uh, tell us about climbing at CU. Well, the first climbing I did at CU was totally uninstructed and without rope. A, a, a buddy of mine and I, a friend who I had in grade school in earlier years, showed up at the University of Colorado the same time I did. and We hadn't seen each other in years. And so we immediately became friends again. And uh, we started climbing by just, like we went up on the third flat iron and just climbed it. You know, ropes, who needed them? And, uh, and if we'd had one, we wouldn't know what to do with it anyway. And certainly we didn't have one because ropes in those days cost almost $20 for 120 feet of uh, nylon rope and couldn't afford that. So uh, Bob Rollins was his name. Bob and I climbed uh, on the flat irons and uh, uh, we found we were quite comfortable doing that sort of thing, and which led us into our first uh, scrape of uh, uh, painting a C on the third flat iron on the 1st of December, I think it was, in 1949. Yeah, this is, this is, has a long history in Boulder. Were, were you and your friend the first to paint the C on the flat iron, do you know? Well, we were the first to paint a C on the third flat iron, but two years before, in 1947, uh, a fellow named Joe painted a little C uh, up near the upper right-hand edge of the first flat iron. And they nabbed him. The cops nabbed him. <laughs> and uh, he was known as Flat Iron Joe for a while. And, but we hadn't heard about that. And uh, apparently we never noticed the sea either when we were there because <clears throat> we thought that uh, CU, University of Colorado, ought to have a C. I mean, you go to mines, they've got a big M, you know, and all of these colleges have, if there's a hill around, will have the, and high schools have a, a, a letter up there someplace. And so we looked around, and to us, the obvious place for a C was the third flat iron. I mean, what could be a better billboard? So when Bob came back from 
his home was Rifle, that's when, where we met. He came back from Rifle after Thanksgiving. He came back with three gallons of white paint because his dad was a professional house painter. <laughs> And uh, someplace we got a four-inch brush, and we uh, probably stole a, a broom from the dorm. I don't know. And uh, on December 1st, it was a full moon night, bright night, and it was warm that fall. It hadn't uh, gotten cold yet. We tried, well, actually, we conned my roommate, who had a car, into taking us up to the Bluebell Shelter Cabin above Chautauqua. Who was that, do you remember? Um, yeah, I, his name was Joe Connell, and uh, Joe, my three roommates, Joe Connell, a, a fellow named Isbester, I don't remember his first name, and the other fellow, I'm not sure I ever knew his name because he was called the General. <laughs> <clears throat> and the reason he was called the General was because he had been a general in the Air Force, and probably one or two star, because the, these three guys were all World War II vets going to school on the GI Bill. And I was the only friend. And, and the dorms were so crowded in those days that two-person dorm rooms were peopled by four students in all cases. <clears throat> and so I had three upperclassmen as my roommates, and I, here's this little greenhorn freshman in there with them. So anyway, we, we got Joe to take us up to the Bluebell Shelter Cabin. It was after dark, so he, he didn't really see this stuff. And you know, we, we put the cans of paint, obviously, and the broom and the brush in the back of his car. And, uh, and, and he must have seen us take it out again when we got to Bluebell, but he was discreet enough not to ask a lot of questions. So we just told him we wanted to go up and climb the third flatter at, at night, you know. So. so we got up there with all of our stuff, and then we hiked up to the base of the third flatter. We, uh, prior to that, we had divided these three cans of paint into four cans so that we each were carrying two cans, and we carried them by hanging the bales of the cans on our, from our belt. We'd put a can on each side, and then we just carried the broom and the brush in our hands. And I've got a, I, after this escapade was over, we got nabbed by the police eventually. We were turned in, and, uh, and it was on the radio, and it was in the newspapers, and my mom lived down in Colorado Springs. And she heard this stuff on the radio, and uh, she wrote me a letter saying, what is going on? What kind of trouble have you gotten yourself into? And we couldn't afford to make long distance calls. So I sat down and I wrote a 10-page letter to her explaining what happened. And I'll read that now because it, it really tells the whole story and is quite funny, I think. <laughs> and this is dated right there. Uh, you know, it isn't dated. <laughs> um, but it had to have been about like December 10th or something in there in 1949. And um, it says, Dear Mom and Bob. Bob was my stepfather. Dear Mom and Bob, well, here's the dirt. When we first got here at CU, Bob and I looked around for a sea or such on the hills around here and didn't find one. We thought what a good idea it would be to have a big sea up somewhere, and the face of the third flat iron was the biggest and flattest surface around, and it could be seen from everywhere. Well, then we kind of forgot about it for a while until Thanksgiving, and when Bob came back, he brought some paint with him, and on Wednesday the 2nd, we decided to go do it before it snowed. It wasn't the 2nd, according to the newspaper clippings I have, and we did it on the 1st. <laughs> Okay, so we decided to go do it while it was still warm and before it snowed. There was a full moon up, too, so there'd be good working conditions. We put the three gallons of paint in four buckets to divide the weight evenly. We got an old broom and asked Joe Connolly to take us up to the shelter house, uh, near the rocks, I say, because <clears throat> we wanted to make a night climb, is our excuse. Joe is my roommate I told you about that ran the freshman outfit. He, he, he ran, in those days, it was a big deal to haze the freshmen, and it was highly organized, and, and my, my roommate was the guy who was instigating this whole thing. He made me go around with his green beanie all the time. <laughs> it's a different world now. <laughs> so we put the stuff in the back seat of Joe's car, 
and he didn't even know it in the dark, so he didn't have anything to do with it. We got to the shelter house about 7.15 and got out all the stuff, and he still didn't know it, except he saw the broom, but he didn't inquire what it was for, so everything was still okay. We trudged up the hill and got to the base of the third flat iron at about 8.15. We hooked the bales of the paint cans into the back of our belts and took off up the rock. We were wearing just jeans and t-shirts and sneakers, or tennis shoes as we called them. At about uh, somewhere close to 9 o'clock, we reached the spot where we were going to put, uh, put up the sea, and we took off the paint cans and opened up one each and started painting. And in retrospect, I, I think we probably didn't, we certainly couldn't dip that broom into the paint can, so we'd probably dribble the, the paint on the rock and then we'd swish it around. And if I recall right, the, the paint, uh, the sea turned out to be about 50 or 60 feet high and maybe 30 feet wide with arm, uh, the, the, the width of the arms maybe two, two and a half feet, something like that. So we'd dribble the paint on and then we'd swish it around. And, we did a remarkably accurate job, <laughs> seeing, the, seeing it from the ground later on. <laughs> so um, we had gone about eight feet when we heard someone below. And we hollered, who's there? And a voice answered, Sherman. Sherman who? That's my last name. So then we asked him what he was doing, and he said he was making a solo night climb. There was nothing to do but tell him, come on up. So when he came up and saw what we were doing, he didn't especially like it. <clears throat> then he said that now he'd have to go back and <clears throat> tell his buddies that he didn't go up there that night because he would, then he'd get blamed for the paint job himself. He griped around about that for a while and that he'd lose all his glory for making the climb and, and then he finally turned around and went down. <clears throat> well, we should have wised up, but we didn't know the seriousness of the business and besides, most anyone, anyway, Bob and I thought, Anyone who went up there and found someone painting a sea would probably stop and help. Uh, we just, we still feel that way now, even though we know, now know the, the consequences. <clears throat> but no, not little boy Sherman. He went down to the dorm and alerted some of his buddies on what was going on. After painting for about three and a half hours, we finished the sea at about 12.30 and started down. <clears throat> we never had any trouble with the climb at any time and had a pretty good time. Well, I was about 20 feet ahead or below Bob, so I stepped off the rock to the ground first. I no sooner touched the ground when some guys rushed out of the trees and one said, let's get them. They ran me under first, but Bob was still on the rock and had my flashlight. He flashed his light on one of them and consequently we could recognize him later. We didn't know what the deal was. We thought that it might be Joe and some buddies playing a big joke trying to scare us or something. You see, while we were still up there painting, we saw a car's lights drive up to the shelter house and then it honked. Well, we thought it might be Joe worrying about us or something. So when these guys jumped up, jumped us, we didn't know what to think. I tried to fight back and get away, but three of them piled on me and we rolled down the hill through the brush and the rocks and then they ended up on top. The fourth one still had Bob on the rock and didn't want to go up and get him because Bob would probably push him off. But Bob told him they didn't have to manhandle him. He'd come down, okay. And that, and that, what the heck was going on anyway? So they tied our hands behind our backs and hobbled them to our ankle and hobbled us down through the rocks and the trees to the shelter house. Then up the hill from there, they tied us each to a tree and took off. That was it. They didn't say a word or give any reasons or anything. We finally got loose at about 1.45 a.m. and went home, to the dorm that is, got the paint off and went to bed. The next morning we went to class as if nothing had happened and registered surprise along with everybody else about the big C on the third flyer. <laughs> but the guys that jumped us the night before had recognized me and since Bob was my pal, we were both accused of doing it two or three times that day but we always denied it. Then that evening we saw the Boulder Daily Camera, the city newspaper. On the front page was a big picture and story all about it. In one place it said we risked life, limb, and a $300 fine. It turned out that the Flatirons were in a city park or something and we had, we had defaced public property. Well, it sure was a big surprise to us. <laughs> now Joe, my roommate, knew who had done it. 
So he and my other two roommates <clears throat> started trying to cover our mess. If we were picked up, they were going to alibi us, but then we told them about Bob. About a year ago, Bob had gotten into some trouble in Rifle and was on probation. So if he was caught doing anything again during his probation, he would get sent up two years for his former offense and the penalty for this one. Well, anyway, my roommates had a talk with Sherman, who, who told uh, them who the others were, and they try, and they tried to, and my roommates tried to scare these guys into keeping quiet, on the angle if they that if they testified against us, we'd get them for assault and battery. They didn't know quite what to think, but one of them took it upon himself to turn me in. We don't know exactly which one it was yet. And I still don't. <laughs> and by the way, after this whole fracas, we all became friends, all those guys that turned us in. <laughs> in the meantime, it was in every paper every day, <clears throat> and in the school paper, and speculation was running as to how it was done, and one paper named the painters the Michelangelos of the Rockies. We were pretty worried, as you can imagine, and then we heard that the paint buckets and the broom had been found. Well, that was worse, because they could take my fingerprints from them. Bob had been wearing an old pair of gloves. Then Friday night, while I was up in Bob's room, John Law visited my roommates, and Joe and the others told him that we had gone to the show or someplace, the movies we call them now. <clears throat> as soon as he left, they came up to Bob's room and told us to get out of there for a while, so we actually did go to the show. When we got back, <clears throat> the general and his, my roommates, told us to go up to the lounge and wait because Joe had something going on that might help. <clears throat> well, Joe came in about 1 o'clock, 1 a.m., and said, let's go. So we took off down the back stairs to his car and took off up the street. He didn't say a word, and we didn't know what the heck was going on. We drove up to a house, and Joe got out and told us to stay there, and he went inside. The susp suspense was killing us, but we were so tired we almost went to sleep waiting. When he came back, he told us that he had just seen one of the best lawyers in town who happened to also be a big wheel in the university. He said that since, of course, that I, that I would get caught, he would influence the judge and get me off easy. We were still trying to keep Bob out of it because of his probation. So at about 7.15 the next morning, they came and took me down to the courthouse and the sheriff and the chief of police and a plain clothesman tried to bluff me into admitting the paint job. I kind of glossed over this part for my mom. Actually what happened uh, was we were put up for the night uh, by some student in Vetsville, which was down there on Arapaho, uh, or near Arapaho. And uh, the next morning Bob and I were walking back to the university to get breakfast at the dorm uh, when this police car pulled up alongside of us, and they're looking for a blonde-headed guy, of course, and that's me. <laughs> and so they nabbed me, but they didn't nab Bob. They let Bob go. <laughs> so they took us down, took me down to the station, so to speak, and tried to bluff me into admitting the paint job. Well, I didn't want to say anything because that lawyer said I didn't have to say anything, and if they wanted to, they would have to prove that I did it. Well, we talked for about 45 minutes and got it clear that if they had to go ahead and prove it, it would go harder than it would if I confessed. Because if it went on to be proved, it would be taken to a civil court, while this way it would only be handled in a police court, same as traffic violations. So since they were sure I did it anyway, and they were sure there were two of us, and I said that I was, that I was one, and then I talked to them about Bob's probation deal, without telling his name. They said since this was a police court matter, it wouldn't matter and that they couldn't do anything about it. That was fine. So I told them Bob's name and then went up, they went up to get him. While I was waiting in another room, my roommates came down but the cops wouldn't let them see me. So the cops went up to school and walked into Bob's chemistry lab class and told him to come along. Everybody looked at him and said, what did you do? <laughs> I guess it was pretty funny. They brought Bob down and took him right into the sheriff's office and tried to get him to confess, but he wouldn't say a word because he didn't know what I'd said. So finally they came and got me and took me in with him. 
Bob said that whatever I wanted to do was okay by him. So I said we might as well say we did it. So we told them the story and then went up to see the judge. My roommates, Joe and Isbester and the general, and a reporter from the camera and the sheriff and the chief of police and the plain clothesman were all there. <laughs> <laughs> the judge ch uh, charged us with defacing public property, and we pleaded guilty. He told us that he could fine us a maximum of $300 apiece. But the sheriff and the plainclothesman said that we had cooperated with them very well and that they hadn't had any previous trouble with us and that we were very nice about the whole thing. Then Bob asked if it would, be, if it would lessen the fine any if we removed the C. The judge said that under the circumstances and all, that if we removed the C, the fine would only be $50 apiece. No mention was ever made of Bob's probation. Joe, my roommate, asked that we be given a week to get the money, and this was granted. Then the judge said he would have the city department, the city <laughs> department, give us anything we needed to clean the C off with, and he gave us his card, and we left. <laughs> <laughs> the reporter took us over to a place and bought, it, bought, bought everybody coffee and me a breakfast, and we talked it all over. He wanted to put in the part about our getting dumped by those four guys, but Joe didn't think it was a good idea. But to be sure, they went up to see another lawyer while I finished breakfast. The lawyer told them that if, he, if we did press charges and that all they would get fined was about $5 apiece, and that the whole deal might snowball around and get into a civil court and it would bring, bring Bob's probation into it. So all that was dropped. We went down to the city department and got two blowtorches and some wire brushes and went home for dinner. Everybody that we'd run into, Joe would introduce us as the boys who painted the sea on the flat iron. And everybody said it was a great job. It was too bad we got caught and it was too bad it had to be taken off. When we got to the dorm, it didn't take 15 minutes before everybody knew what had happened and who the guys were who jumped us and squealed on us. Everybody was up in arms about it <laughs> and was out for those guys' blood. Now when any one of those guys goes into the mess hall and sits down at a table, everybody gets up and leaves him sitting alone. <laughs> Not a word is spoken to him. <laughs> An old lady who serves in the line said, Not only to us, that she had lived in Boulder all her life and she was glad to see the sea and that she would like to throw hot coffee on those boys <laughs> that turned us in. <laughs> all the proctors and counselors in the dorm were for us and about 95% of the students on the campus were for us. We went up and began work on the sea that Saturday afternoon and also Sunday. Sunday we didn't come down to the dorm for lunch, but the dietitian sent us up a steak dinner and milk and hot coffee and tomatoes and cookies. <laughs> Everybody was uh, real swell about it. Uh, all afternoon Saturday and all day Sunday, there were cars going up to the shelter house to watch us work. Then all day Monday and Tuesday, reporters were calling us up to know all the details and one guy from the Denver Post came up and took our pictures in our climbing clothes with the blowtorches and the Rocky Mountain News got the picture and the story from them and, and when their story came out the next day there were about 40 quotes in it that I was supposed to have said and neither one of us had ever said over three words. And then it was all on the radio two or three times and they kept pronouncing Bob's last name wrong and that great Bob. Well Tuesday Joe sent a can, set a can out at each chow line at noon with a card on it saying help. We need a hundred dollars to help the fine. We collected twenty-one dollars that time but then Mr. Grosshauser, the director of housing, put a screeching halt to that with no soliciting on campus. So we can't get any more, any more money from anyone on the campus unless they just come right out and donate. And students need to be pushed and convinced so we probably won't get any. Anyway, we'll only have to pay forty dollars a piece out of our own pockets. A man that owns the filling station where we bought our gas for the torches donated two dollars. <laughs> Everybody says hello and guys call us by name that we never even knew before, never saw before. Then Tuesday Bob got a call from Life Magazine representative in Denver and said they wanted to do a story on us. So Wednesday they came up and got permission from President Stearns who had in the meantime fixed it with the judge so that we didn't have to clean any more of it off. 
Stearns finally got to thinking, you know, this is pretty dangerous up there. If those guys get hurt or killed, the university is going to get it in this. <laughs> so, so he, he told us that we shouldn't be up there anymore. So we didn't have to clean any more of it off. So uh, he let us go uh, up there so that they would take pictures of us cleaning us off, cleaning it off. So we went up there and climbed it, and they took pictures with a telephoto lens. Actually, the photographer tried to climb the, the third flat iron with us, but he couldn't do it. <laughs> so he had to stay on the ground. <laughs> the Rocky Mountain Rescue Group here is going to have to take it off now, and that tickles everyone, especially us. Tickles us pink because the five who will have to do it are Sherman and the four guys who jumped us that night. <laughs> That about brings everything up to date, I guess, except that now they are having radio debates and taking polls to see if CU should put up a permanent C somewhere on a hill around here. So I guess we started something. The rest of it's per, uh, personal. <laughs> so uh, after that, as you know, the C would get repainted every couple of years. And uh, then one year, um, I, one year a U was put up, so it was C, uh, CU, and then that was altered to a DU, and then an I was put up, ICU. <laughs> and finally, uh, somebody, I mean, possibly was the climbers with the Rocky Mountain Rescue Group again, of which I was a member by then, uh, finally uh, uh, succeeded in almost eliminating the C and the U by painting it with camouflage colors. Because what happened when we burned uh, the, the uh, paint off, we ended up burning all the lichens off, and there was this bright red exposed sandstone that was as visible as the white sea had been. <laughs> so they had to go up and camouflage that area. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to stop for a minute. So that was the beginning of my climbing <laughs> while I was a student at CU. Um, uh, we formed a lot of friendships out of that fracas uh, because everybody knew who we were. And uh, we ultimately joined the Rocky Mountain Rescue Group, uh, or I did, Bob didn't. Um, and uh, I began active rock climbing uh, on the Flatirons and elsewhere. I wasn't a particularly good climber. Uh, but I, I managed to get up everything I tried. And uh, I think the thing that set me apart from most climbers was that I was always interested in, in something new. I was innovative. I wanted to go do new routes rather than just follow in the footsteps of other people. And uh, a couple of things that I did that uh, made my reputation, not that they were any particular big deal, was uh, um, did the first ascent of the East Ridge of the Maiden, which is a prominent rock south of Boulder. What do you uh, mean by a first ascent? The first time that that route was ever climbed. The Maiden had already been climbed in prior years by a route that, that approaches it from the west uh, along a rock rib and then goes on to the north side of the uh, rock. It's a, the, the Maiden is a thin fin of rock about maybe 400 feet high, vertical, over on both sides. The western side actually has a prow kind of like this. It overhangs. So when you climb it, you repel down, you're dangling down. It's a free repel. You dangle down until you finally reach this, this ridge that comes up from it. So we did a first ascent of the east ridge of that rock. <clears throat> and the Maiden has a companion rock nearby called the Matron, built quite differently, but again a thin rib of rock a thin blade sticking up, and we made a first ascent of the south face of that. I did with uh, another friend, uh, Phil Robertson. And then I made two first ascents by two different routes up the overhanging west overhang of the Maiden. That is the, the overhang down which everybody repels. Um, I had belayers on that, but uh, they didn't choose to follow me. So once I got to the top, I simply uh, repelled back down. But it, the West Overhang of the Maiden is a spectacular thing, and that caught everybody's attention, and I was instantly famous around Boulder as a gee whiz rock climber. Um, I didn't do much high mountain climbing while in college. 
uh, because I didn't have the transportation. And, uh, and I did try to keep my nose to the grindstone a little bit. Finally graduated in 1954 with a BA in geology. What did you do after graduating? After graduating, I had accumulated a debt. Uh, the money that I had earned in, during summer jobs didn't quite cover my school expenses, so I had borrowed money, and now I had to pay it off somehow. So I went to Climax, which is Climax Molybdenum Corporation, had a large open pit mine there. Actually, it wasn't open pit, it was a block caving operation where they tunneled in, uh, set charges and caved it from within, and then scooped it into ore cars, which ran outside to the, uh, to the mill outside. Anyway, I got a job at the uh, Climax uh, mine on the engineering staff. I was a, an engineer's helper. I knew nothing about underground surveying. My, I, I, there were no openings in the geology department, uh, which is where I really wanted to get a job, but couldn't. And uh, so I earned enough money uh, at Climax to pay off my debt. And uh, the following spring, or following fall, I got my draft notice. The draft was in effect at that time. In fact, uh, it was at the tail end of the uh, uh, Korean War. I had had a student deferment all through college. Uh, by the time I got drafted, uh, thank the Lord, uh, the war was over, so I no longer considered I was going to be cannon fodder. But I was uh, sent to uh, uh, Fort Bliss, Texas for uh, my basic training. A hot hell hole. God, it was awful. And, and the, another interesting thing was, <clears throat> during World War II, a lot of uh, German prisoners were sent to the United States to be imprisoned until the war was over. And they were sent all over the country. <clears throat> and one of the places they were sent was in uh, uh, Fort Bliss, Texas. And they had, a, they had strings of rows of these little huts that they must have put oh, four to six prisoners in each one. These things were now dilapidated and falling down. And I remember one of them, when you stepped in the door, you stepped right through a hole in the floor onto the ground. And so this was our barracks. <laughs> oh, After uh, graduation from basic training, I was sent to Fort Gordon, uh, Georgia. It was Camp Gordon in those days, to uh, the Signal Corps. I was uh, put in the... Uh, uh, telephone Repair and uh, Installation School, which was an eight-week school. And uh, stupidly, I did so well that they wanted to, that they decided to keep me afterward as an instructor. So I never, all my buddies were being sent to Germany and Japan and neat places to go. They never let me out of the state. <laughs> Uh, I got an early out to go back to school. They were trying to reduce the armed forces, even though the draft was still <laughs> active. They were letting guys out early. And I went back for a summer semester at the University of Colorado. And uh, I was married by then. Uh, and after that, then I, I had to find a job. And I got a job with a, at the time, small oil company a Texas oil company called J. Ray McDermott and Company, uh, which had a, an office in Denver. And uh, so there, I made the second geologist in the firm. We had a land man, an engineer, and a secretary. And uh, I spent three years with that uh, outfit and discovered I hated the oil business because it meant going out in the worst places like out in Kansas and Nebraska and sitting on a well, and everything seemed to happen at night on a well. You'd be out there <clears throat> freezing your buns in the wintertime, looking at well logs and looking at, uh, at cores and well cuttings, and it was just miserable. And uh, so after three years of that, I uh, accepted an invitation from Jerry Cunningham to join his company, the original Jerry Company. Jerry had been in the mountain troops in World War II. And when that was over, he began making his own equipment because the Army equipment was so atrocious. It was heavy. It was, 
it carried badly. You could a 40-pound load carried like a 100-pound load. It was it just broke your back. So he was making his own stuff, and went into uh, selling it mail order to make a living. And uh, his business had grown to the point where he felt he needed help, and he asked me to join him, and so I did. That was in Boulder. And that was in Boulder. In order to to uh, support my salary, which wasn't much, uh, we opened a retail store in Boulder. And this store was located on Broadway, just south of, uh, of Arapahoe, south of where uh, Wild Oats is today. At that time, that was in the original buildings of Western Cutlery. They had already moved out, however, and uh, uh, we took over a machine shop, which had a concrete floor, which was coated with grease. The place was a terrible mess, and we spent about two months getting it into shape for uh, to open a store. Anyway, we finally opened that store, and I began selling Jerry equipment, uh, and that's how that's where my salary came from. Um, later on, we opened uh, we moved that store down to the present location of Mountain Sports on West Pearl. It was called Jerry Mountain Sports. That was a new corporation that we had formed. And after a couple of years, we opened another very small store up on the hill, right next door to the sink. Uh, that only lasted two or three years, and we closed it down. It wasn't uh, profitable. When you were with Jerry, did you do any of the help with any design of the equipment? Yeah, I knew nothing about design, and I learned a lot. I have a lot. I owe, I owe Jerry Cunningham a lot uh, in uh, learning how to design and make outdoor uh, clothing and packs and tents and sleeping bags and all that. Um, a number of the uh, clothing designs were mine. Uh, I, was, I designed a method of hiding the hood of a jacket in the collar through uh, an opening at the base of the collar in back. That was the very first jacket of its kind in the country that had a hidden hood in the collar. Um, we uh, got uh, a contract at one time with the Air Force to design a uh, Arctic survival suit for pilots who might have to eject over the Arctic. And so we had to figure out how to make a one-size-fits-all, full-length, down-filled garment, which also had to be uh, vacuum-packed into the ejection seat of the airplane. And uh, we had a great time with that. Uh, we, we got this full-length suit, which would fit me. I'm six foot two. And also could be gathered up by ties, string ties, to fit Bob Swartz, who was with us at, by then. Bob was only five foot four, I think. So it was truly one size fits all. And we figured out how to vacuum pack this thing into the required space, which was one inch thick by about 12 inches square. Uh, that was no mean feat. It took us a long time to do that one. And we were afraid to let the thing go for fear it would kill us when it came out. But of course, it really wasn't that dangerous. Um, during those Jerry years, we, uh, we, we made the uh, official ski parkas for the ski school at Arapaho Basin. Um, we opened a store in San Francisco. We opened a store in Denver. Uh, we started wholesaling to various stores, and that was a big mistake. And <clears throat> Jerry and I got in a big fracas over that because I could see that it, this, this was going to run us into the ground. Uh, we weren't very, making very much money with our own operation, let alone trying to sell uh, goods to other retail stores at a reduced price so that they could in turn sell it at our prices. I mean, we were, we were losing money. Jerry wanted to do it, and there was no talking him out of it. So finally, in the end, it, it forced me out of the company. Jerry, I learned a very, very, very valuable lesson from that, and that is if you ever go into business with somebody, have controlling interest. Jerry had 51% of the stock in Jerry Mountain Sports. I had 49%, so it was bye-bye Dale. <laughs> uh, 
After that, I, uh, I went to work for a bank in Denver. Uh, I entered on the, uh, the training program, the same as kids fresh out of college. Uh, which means that you, you spend about a month or a few weeks anyway in every department in the bank. This was Denver's largest bank at the time. It, it was called the Denver United States National Bank and it was the merger of the Denver National and the United States National Bank. Uh, had about 800 employees, uh, occupied uh, four floors of a, of a large office building down there. And so anyway, I went through all of these departments with all of the trainees and ended up in the data processing department where I learned about computers and I didn't become a programmer but I, I learned uh, <clears throat> how computers operated and how you entered the data and and, and it, it was uh, the second most valuable thing in my business career finding out that computers weren't just for giant corporations computers were for everybody and so actually the second year of my own company which I'll talk about later I was using computers already. So I was with the bank, I, I was with Jerry for eight years in the Jerry Mountain sports business. I was with the bank for three years, during which time I realized I hated working for other people. Uh, and the thing that really was the, the straw that broke the camel's back for me at the bank was that the bank had this, this, this idea that every employee was a salesman or salesperson for the bank. And since I ended up in management, management, all of management had to go out and sell banking services. I mean, we had to go out, we had to, to go visit businesses up and down all of the streets in Denver or Boulder or all the surrounding towns. We had to sell checking accounts. We had to talk people into checking accounts, savings accounts, whatever services we could get to pull money into the bank. God, I hated that. I hated that the worst way. Some guys quit over it. <clears throat> and ultimately, I left the bank, too. While I was working for the bank, uh, I, I was looking around for some way to get out. And I didn't want to just go get a job someplace else. As I said, I was not eager to work for other people. So it occurred to me that maybe I could start my own business. And uh, at one time, when I was with Jerry, he had an idea of making kits, but the way he did it made it so difficult for the kit maker, for the customer, that it just was a total failure. I mean, we, we sold maybe, who knows, seven or eight kits the whole time. What do you mean by kit? He, a kit in this, a kit was to say, say a customer wanted to make a sleeping bag from scratch. He'd have to figure out how to do the whole darn thing by himself. But if we made a kit, we would make a set of instructions, uh, give him a set of patterns perhaps, so they would enable him to cut out the parts and then the instructions would show him how to put it together and how to put in the down and everything. And if he used down, it was a terrible mess. Actually, in the Jerry uh, trial, we did not make any down kits. But the way Jerry did it was, <clears throat> He had the, the patterns drawn out on, on uh, a grid, graph paper, uh, you know, so that the pattern would maybe be nine or seven inches tall. And it was up to the customer then to enlarge that pattern onto a butcher paper or whatever he could find to his size, the size he wanted, and then cut it out and then transfer that to cloth. And then Jerry's instructions were very sketchy. So, I mean, it made it so difficult for the customer that I noticed there are a lot of people interested in that, but hardly anybody doing it. So, I thought, you know, there ought to be a good way to make kits. And, and so, uh, nights and weekends at home, I figured out how to do it. And one of the jobs that I had to do, I had, uh, of course, before I started my company, before I started selling anything, I had to have something to sell. So I had to design a number of uh, items to start with. A down vest, uh, down two different down-filled sleeping bags, uh, a rain parka, a, uh, well, I have here uh, my first catalog, uh, which was a brochure which will show some of these articles. I'll put this thing up here. This page shows the sleeping bags. 
Um, I had two different, three different models. They were all downfilled and uh, had various characteristics. You can see the one on the right is called the Bighorn, sold in kit form for $49.95. And in my advertising, oops, my advertising here, my, my, my copy, I say this bag is the equal of most 75 to 95 down bags on, dollar down bags on the market. That was, in those days, you could get the best downfilled sleeping bag you could buy for $95. <laughs> Where was your company located, Dad, when you were first? Well, when I first started out, everything was in my home. The other side shows a, a down sweater, uh, a, a large, uh, thick coat I called the Tundra jacket, and the down vest and a hood to go with this jacket. So uh, I did all of this kit designing. I did all of the designing of the kits, riding the bus back and forth between Denver and Boulder because I lived in Boulder. I worked at the bank in Denver. And it was a good hour each way on the bus. And I imagine most people on the bus thought I was pretty antisocial because I wouldn't talk to anybody. I'd sit there with my clipboard. And uh, my procedure for designing kits was to think the entire thing through in my head first and write the instructions before I ever drew a pattern. And the reason for that was uh, some kits were fairly complex. And of course, everything has to be done in a particular order. And uh, I had the ability, still do, of visualizing all of these parts and how they went together. And if I would get several steps down the way and realize that the next step I envisioned really should have been done back four steps, I could simply go back in the, in the instructions that I was writing and, and insert it. And so I would, I, would, I would have the whole thing figured out on paper first. And then I would make the patterns. And then I would cut out one and sew it together and, and make revisions after that, because seldom was the very first thing uh, correct. So I, uh, I did that. And uh, where in Boulder were you living? I, I was living at 1965 Dartmouth Avenue at the time. Uh, and I set up my business in the basement of my house. I built a cutting table out of plywood and uh, two befores. Uh, and I, I ordered cloth from the big cloth companies, you know, a whole hundred yards at a time because you couldn't get any less. <laughs> and uh, I ordered uh, 25 pounds of down at a time because you couldn't buy it in any smaller bags. A 25-pound bag of down, by the way, was about four or five feet tall and a and about uh, three feet in diameter. And uh, so on weekends and, and evenings, I would uh, uh, fill orders. I would cut stuff out and make package them all up in the kits. And, uh, and, and uh, then I would, when I finally started getting orders from this brochure that I've just shown, uh, I. Uh, then would fill these orders on weekends, take them to the post office, and, uh, and and mail them out. The beauty of the mail order business was and is that you have the customer's money before you have to send him anything. There are no accounts receivable. Um, I didn't uh, have any customers at all, of course, until I sent out the brochure, and I couldn't send the brochure to anybody until I had advertised. So my initial ads, little two-inch square ads, were in things like, at that time, the Sierra Club was uh, accepting advertising in the Sierra Club Bulletin. Uh, there was a magazine called Backpacker. Uh, and uh, I f I'm not sure where else I advertised in the very beginning. Later on, uh, we did advertising in Field and Stream, Outdoor Life, uh, Sunset Magazine, uh, all of the outdoor magazines. And at one point uh, in the couple of years before I sold my company, we were producing television ads and radio ads uh, for local consumption because at that time we had several local stores. How did you get the name Frostline? Frostline came about out of thin air. I, while I'm working for the bank, I'm thinking, what am I going to name this outfit? <clears throat> so I went through a number of names, quite a lot of names. Finally. 
Frost line just seemed like that sounded good. It sounded kind of outdoorsy and cold weatherish, you know. So I thought, frost line, that sounds good. Now I got to invent a, a logo. So I thought what would go with that would be a snowflake. So I went down to the, to the Denver Public Library on my lunch hour, and I discovered that they had four volumes, almost an inch thick, each volume. These were big things, eight and a half by 11 or bigger, uh, just photographs of snowflakes. Because I guess it's true, you've, we've all heard that every snowflake is different. And they had four volumes of snowflake pictures. Every one of them was different. So I thumbed through those things for a couple of lunch hours till I found just the snowflake I thought was perfect. And I traced it. <clears throat> then I had to figure out how to make a logo out of this. So I looked in the phone book and I discovered a graphic designer who was a couple of blocks from the bank. And, uh, and I went up there on a lunch hour and went in and he was a one-man show. And I showed him, I told him the name, and I showed him my snowflake, which I had drawn very carefully by then. I, I did get one thing out of engineering. My first year of engineering training at the University of Colorado was how to make it good, accurate, clear engineering drawings. So I had this really spiffy snowflake. So I, I, I showed him to this guy, and uh, he said, well, uh, let's, let's Let's pick a, a, a style for the name. Uh, he says, uh, so he, he typed it into his machine, and he could, uh, it, we didn't have, he didn't have a computer, but he had some machine that uh, would uh, put words in different type styles. And uh, almost the first one he came up with it looked so good to me, I said, that looks great. Let's use it. And we decided, decided not to use capital letters. It was a lowercase. F, frost line, and uh, then he said, uh, well, look, how about this, and he reversed, the F-R-O-S-T was a black, were all black letters, the L-I-N-E were white letters in a black outline, so it became frost line, frost line, and then in his machinery, he was able to superimpose that word on my drawing of the snowflake and project it onto a screen. And I mean, you know, in 15 minutes, we had it. And I said, gee, that's great. And he printed it out for me. He said, and I said, that's great. How much do I owe you? And he says, ah, oh, forget it. He knew this wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> so that's how I made the logo. What were the uh, breakthroughs that you had to overcome in, in the design and being able to get the Dow into the kits? The down packaging was the, 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 the real breakthrough. Without a, a means of enabling the customer to put the down in a garment or a sleeping bag, I would not be able to market any downfield kits. So uh, I developed a bag, closed it, a long skinny bag, about two feet long, and about six inches in diameter, maybe four inches. Actually, I had a number of different sizes, come to think of it. Uh, this bag was closed at one end and turned back on itself halfway so that, so that it was a double-walled bag closed at one end and open on the other end, into which I inserted a measured amount of down by weight, quarter of an ounce, a half ounce, whatever, and then stitched it closed with a, uh, a very out of whack stitch so that you could just simply pull on one thread and, an, and the end would open up. Then you'd put that open end into the compartment where you wanted to put the down, grab a hold of the cuff back here and push on the closed end of the packet and just shove it all the way through there, which would turn the whole thing inside out, shoving the down ahead of it into the garment. And then you'd carefully pull that out get down all over your living room anyway because this packet was made of the only material I could use at the time, a, a very porous uh, uh, paper called Pellon. Uh, 